Carol Byrne. I'm one of the business librarians here at ETA. And this afternoon, mm -hmm. I'd like to welcome you to Focus on Faculty. Um, the series started in about 2002-2003. It's sponsored by the libraries and by Kappa Phi Honor Society. Today I have the privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Jean Lu, Jean Mu Lee, Assistant Professor of Information Systems at, in the College of Business. He received his doctorate in 2015 from the University of Texas at Austin, joined our faculty in the fall of 2015, and very shortly Dr. Lee is going to move on to the University of British Columbia at Vancouver, but we have him here today to speak to us. His research interest covers large data, uh, data analytics. Uh, he's interested in the mining and deep learning. So please help me welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you for your, your uh, the nice introduction. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here. I know it's a pretty busy season at the end of the semester. You have a lot of projects and homeworks and <laughs> exams, so very happy to have you here. So today I'm going to talk about my research on uh, how to use big data in, in the business setting. So, <coughs> so briefly explaining my research. So overall, I call it the business analytics. So what it is, it's to try to analyze large data set to make business decisions. So that's what we want to do. So companies are collecting a lot of data sets. For example, uh, Facebook is collecting your likes and shares, your photos. Um, your cellular company is collecting, actually they're collecting your 3G LTE data to analyze your behavior and then try to target uh, some advertisements. Um, so in this big data setting, there's a few challenges. So one challenge is that um, 80 to 90% of the data set is in unstructured format. So traditionally, people, when people did analytics, they worked on numeric data. So take the average, take the median, or you have distribution. However, things that if you think about your Facebook feed or Twitter feed, or even the documents from uh, business operations, these are textual data. And many of the data set is in the photos and videos. So uh, how do we make sense out of this unstructured data? That's a big challenge. So my solution for that is machine learning, text mining, deep learning. So I'm gonna, today I'm going to introduce uh, four different topics. Maybe it could be a little lengthy, but I'll try to make it more for a general audience. Uh, so these are my four uh, area on big data. So uh, as, uh, as I was just introduced, I worked on mobile technology for a long time. I worked as a Sam as a uh, software engineer uh, at Samsung Electronics on mobile devices. So if you uh, have a Galaxy phone, uh, I worked on it. The very first one, not the recent one. Uh, <laughs> not the one that could explode. <laughs> so yeah, the first, very first one I worked on it. So I was very interested in mobile technology. So um, a few projects I worked on is a mobile application market. So uh, Google Play Store, Android, or uh, Apple I, I, for App Store. Um, one company I work with is called US Cellular. Uh, have you heard of this company? So this is like, uh, it's in the Chicago area. It's a regional cellular provider. So, it, so they collected their 3G network data. So people use, use their mobile app. That app generates a lot of traffic, mobile traffic. Uh, but the thing is that mobile apps, you cannot really identify what they are by just looking at the traffic. So we have to come up with some fingerprint of the app. So that's what I worked on. So try to analyze what kind of apps people are using and try to come up with an automatic way to get the fingerprints. That's what I worked on. Uh, second topic I work on is social media analytics. So Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare. Uh, so I'm going to uh, present one of my work with Yahoo. Uh, third topic is a mobile, uh, uh, sorry, business analytics. So I work with, uh, the very first uh, project I worked on business analytics was with AT&T. So back in 2011, so I was intern doing an internship there. Um, that was the time they started uh, their smartphone business. So they, they introduced iPhone to AT&T. Uh, the thing is that, AT that iPhone generated a lot of mobile traffic, but AT&T was not really ready for that. So their network capacity was not ready. So you have a lot of call drops or slow network. So people complain about that. 
Um, so there are a few ways you, you express your complaints. So one is to make a call, but that takes a long time. So they know that. It takes uh, 20 to 30 minutes to get to an operator. So instead, people uh, just tweeted about their complaints. So they started the Twitter analytics project to collect tweets about AT&T and isolate uh, the location of the complaints and also what kind of complaints they have. So that's what I worked on. Um, a fourth topic is on cybersecurity. So I'm going to uh, briefly touch upon uh, each of the topics today. So first one, mobile analytics. Um, so this project is a uh, joint work with uh, my colleagues from UConn, Hanson University, and UT Austin. So giving you a background, so I guess maybe all of you are using smartphone now. Yeah, so you're, you're using a lot of apps. So app market is very popular now. So in the Google Play Store or Apple App Store, we have more than a million apps, one million apps in each of them. Windows Phone and BlackBerry, they also try to catch it up. Um, because the market is so crowded, the app developer wants, um, it's very hard to promote their new app because it's still crowded. So there are a few ways to advertise their app, uh, mobile, new app, mobile app. So first one is display app. Um, so if you see some uh, news article, maybe you have a banner app to promote a new application, you click it, you install it. Or uh, sometimes if you're playing mobile app games, sometimes you will see that the game introduced another game. And then if you install the new game, you get some credit. So you can purchase some items in your other game. So that's called cross promotion. Uh, third one now uh, in the social media feed, you will see a lot of app, uh, advertisement as well. Uh, the one I'm working on is on cross promotion. Oh, this is called cross promotion. So it's incentivized mechanism in the sense that uh, the new app developer pay the uh, the advertising developer based on the number of installs they get, and the user get incentivized because for the original app they get an item. So in the case of display ads, uh, you don't really get anything. I mean, as a customer, but in this case, uh, second case, you get some three items. Okay, so uh, in the economic sense, this is called two-sided market. So where you have one side, uh, popular, a set of popular apps, the other side, the new app developers. And then somehow you need to match them together in this market. So this is called two-sided two matching market. I work with a company in Korea so, uh, called IGA Works. So this is a mobile uh, app advertising company doing the cross-promotion. So they conducted uh, about 1,900 different uh, cross promotions with uh, about mm, about 300 yeah 300 mobile applications with uh, six uh, six month of period uh, they intentionally uh, randomly assigned this matching to see what kind of matches uh, have better performance in terms of advertising and it involved about one million one million user so on the right hand side this is an example so this is an app that promotes the other apps so, so they are seven different cross-promotion going on in this case. Um, so they wanted to um, analyze how successful these advertisements are, I like. So there are a few people who just download these apps without any advertisement. So they call it organic users. These are organic users. So I mean, it's hard to see, but it's in this line. And then there's people you get acquired from the display ad, and then there are people you get from cross-promotion ad. So if you look at this red uh, uh, square area, you see that the organic users are pretty, uh, so y-axis, sorry, y-axis is how, how many time, how much time they spend on this new app <coughs> after they download. So if you are an organic user, you already have your incentive to install it, so you use it. So that's obvious. Uh, display ad users are okay, but you see that cross-promotion, uh, the user required by cross-promotion are not so active after they install. Uh, the issue is called free writing. So you install this app because you want the, the credit, not that you want to use the app. So that's, uh, that's an that's a issue. However, the, uh, if you look at the three uh, right-hand side, uh, right side bars, if you carefully select the matches, actually people do like the app and then they use it for a long time. Uh, then the question is, what makes a good match? So it's like, a, it's like a marriage problem. So you have <laughs> women and men, and which matches will, <laughs> will last for a long time. <laughs> uh, 
So that's the same problem. Uh, actually, um, this uh, in the economics, it's called um, matching theory, two-sided matching uh, theory. And their example is actually marriage. So how do you make a stable marriage? And what's the algorithm to generate that? Um, sim another example is, um, it could be school admission problem. So you have high school students who are graduating, and then you have a public, uh, sorry, uh, middle school student graduating, and then you have high school admission. So how do you match them together to um, satisfy all the people? So that's actually the uh, New York public school system, they implemented this new matching problem. Um, another problem is uh, in the hospital, medical, medical school, when they graduate, they need to do residency. So they have a lot of uh, residents, and then the hospitals, they need to match them together. They implement this matching uh, market to optimize it. So we use that idea in this uh, mobile app context. Um, oh, so, so then our hypothesis is that what makes a good match? So our hypothesis is that if you have an app and then use new app, if they are totally different, I mean, you won't like it, right? So it should be relevant. So how do you measure this relevance? So we use a text mining uh, algorithm called topic modeling on the mobile application's descriptions. Um, so we have about 200,000 mobile applications. Sorry, this is in, uh, in Korean, uh, this is in Korean market. So these are the Korean text data. And the algorithm extracted these topics. So music, kids, English, and Christian. So we can categorize uh, these apps based on this text mining algorithm. And then we will match based on the similarity. So if music app, we will introduce another slightly different music app. But we won't uh, promote, say, kids app to the music app user, for example. Okay. Uh, this is a system we built. Um, so we collect the data from App Store and Google Play Store. We gather it in our database. And then we uh, use our text mining algorithm to extract it, the, the category. And then uh, we have a matching market where the left-hand side we have the, so target app is the new app developers who want to promote. On the right-hand side, we have the source app developers who is the popular app developers. So we, have, we try to make this matching engine that will put them together. And when we do the matching, we use the text mining results. And uh, I'm actually, um, so I'm, like, I'm not really giving you all the details, mathematical details. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, just, this is a graph uh, showing we have, based on this new matching algorithm, we can get 100% uh, performance improvement. So after people download it, they use it for at least 2x time. So that was my, our first mobile analytics. Yes. So since you brought it up, so this, the matching is done on strings of zeros and ones, right? So the computer doesn't have a concept of Christian. It just knows what, Correct. Yeah. what those words are. Yes. And it's, That's so, it is, so you're looking for correlations, you're looking for what is the mathematics? A little bit of mathematics. Yeah. Um, so we cap based. On, so each app will be represented as a vector, where the vector uh, each dimension is a topic. So for example, it could be um, a music topic or kids topic, English topic. Uh, in the traditional um, app genre, you one app can only be in one genre, but in this case, we have a distribution over different genres. And then you have vectors and calculate vector similarity. And based on that similarity, so you're going to recommend similar apps. Hmm. But actually, um, I didn't really say it here, but it turns out when people download the app, they try to um, avoid the same app. Because you already have that app, right? So you, you need some diversity. Hmm. So when they download, they actually like the, uh, an app that is slightly different but not so different. Uh, but actually, when they, after they download, when they use it, they don't like the diversified app. <laughs> they just stick with the, whatever they, they are using. Mm. So that's what we found on this, on this project. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, okay, so the second topic is on social media analytics. Uh, this is a work with, uh, joint work with I mean, a lot of people from Amazon, Yukon, Austin, Yahoo Research. Um, so actually, we did work with Yahoo on this project. So let me give you some context. Um, I mean, obviously, we're using a lot of social media, Facebook. Uh, this event has been 
announced through Facebook. Um, so you, you see this graph over here. Over time, we have now about uh, 2 million users, social media users. Okay, so because a lot of people are using social media, companies are using social media to promote their uh, to new products or any events, right? Uh, so their spending, advertising spending has been doubled. Based on different uh, metrics, over the few years, uh, the advertising spending has been doubled. So they're spending a lot of money. Okay, so that's the old background. Uh, but the thing is that, I mean, when I started this talk, I mentioned that the data is in unstructured format, photos and videos. So if you do text mining, like the, one, the project I did before, uh, you can only handle 15% of the social media content because 75, uh, about 80% of the content includes video or photos. So if you don't understand the photo, you're blind for the 85%. So this is an issue. So they wanted to solve this problem. <coughs> um, so uh, Yahoo has a uh, Yahoo acquired this blogging site called Tumblr. It's like Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, they acquired it. Um, so in Tumblr, a lot of companies are have their own account and promoting app, uh, their products and services. So these are some examples of BMW, Vogue, IBM. Uh, there are many different companies in Tumblr. Uh, this is an example blog post for a uh, company called uh, ModCloth. This is a fashion company. So they have a new product. Uh, in the image, they have the textual description. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, something called notes, which is the user reaction. So you post something, people like it or share it with, it, with their friends. So this is the company-generated data. This is the user-generated data. Uh, and the question we want to answer here is that what kind of blog posts are getting more likes? So that's a recent question. So uh, well, what kind of posts get more likes or reshares? Uh, and then we want to take advantage of the photos and videos and the text together. All right, so this is our Tumblr data. Uh, about 33,000 uh, 33, posts from 178 companies. Uh, in terms of the sectors, we have automobile, entertainment, a lot of different sectors. You see that 90% uh, of the post art has photos in it. Um, let me ask you a question. So, if you see a photo, what kind of photos would you like? If you see a, maybe a celebrity, you would like it. If you see a cat photo, you would like it, maybe. <laughs> Or um, some people will like beautiful scenery photo, or some people may like adult content. Um, humor. Huh? Sometimes humor. Humors, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Uh, so first, uh, let's think about the photos. And then these are some uh, features we can extract from photos, like how beautiful it is, adult content, celebrity, how flashy an image is, how complex an image is. Uh, how is it possible? Uh, I'm using a technique called deep learning. So this is a brand new machine learning uh, technique to analyze images. Um, this is a little technical, but I will try to make it simple. So you have a photo, and we have a layer of transformation. So each layer, so first layer, I'm, uh, this is my raw picture. I'm going to make it as edges. And then with the edges, I'm going to create a, uh, an object. So over time, uh, at the end of endless layer, we have the prediction. So in this picture, 94% boat is in, in there. And this is, uh, so this is, in, this machine learning model is inspired by human brain. So human brain, we have neurons and they're connected by synapses. I don't know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not good at this, com this neuro uh, neuroscience, but uh, uh, this computation model is uh, inspired by that. So each of this is called, is, we consider this a neuron, artificial neuron, and they're connected as a network. So the neuron network, neural network, understands the picture. Um, actually, this model has been there for at least 50 years, but it has been recently being very successful because of three reasons. So one is some, there is some uh, theoretical breakthrough uh, on mathematical way. So second thing is big data. So now we have a lot of photos and tags associated to it. We can use that data to train this neural network. 
this, this neural network needs to know, uh, see a lot of photos to understand. Millions of photos to understand. Uh, third is uh, the computational power. So um, this, my computer has a CPU in it, but CPU is not really fast. So there's another uh, thing called GPU, uh, generic computation unit. So if you're playing 3D games, so that use, uses a lot of computational power. So instead of relying on CPU, it uses the GPU, which is a parallelized computation. So NVIDIA is a company that's famous for this. Uh, NVIDIA stock price has been skyrocketed last year because of this. So they realized that GPU can be used for deep learning. So Facebook, Google, Yahoo, everyone is using the deep learning. And they bought a lot of GPUs. NVIDIA had me. <laughs> so that's what I use here as well. Uh, I don't know, last year, uh, have you seen the, the, the Go game between uh, Lisa Doll and AlphaGo? Have you heard of AlphaGo? So Google has this company called Google Brain. Actually, before that, it was called DeepMind. Mm -hmm. So this company is, uh, was uh, creating this machine learning model to play Go game. So actually, for chess, um, about 20 years ago, 20 years ago, IBM Deep Blue have beaten the champion, world champion. Mm -hmm. Things that for chess, chess situation, you don't have many possible moves. Mm -hmm. If you have a big computer, you can calculate all possible moves and then get the best one. So that's what they did. In the case of Go, the number of possible moves is like almost infinity. So that's why they couldn't do it for a long time. But recently they used deep learning and they found that they could do it. And last year they beat the world champion. Mm -hmm. And people thought, well, and the thing is that well, another thing is that so deep learning actually learned the human pattern, and like this is the kind of move they need to do. But actually, they use all the, all those knowledge together to build a new strategy. The computer built a new strategy, and when the first the champion saw that strategy, they thought this is stupid. But at the end of the day, all the champions say, "Oh, that's actually a nice move." They never thought about it before. Yeah. So that's uh, that was uh, some story. Okay, so uh, how do we train this model? So we're, uh, there's a project called ImageNet. This is for Stanford University. So they uh, have a, a lot of photos, and these are the tags associated to it. So this, this is like the training data set for the neural network um, and to train the model. Um, the thing is that, so what do we know is that um, given a photo, we can recognize, okay, this, we have some people here. I guess they are business people. They, maybe they are, uh, they wear glasses. So it's recognizing objects from the photo. Uh, there are more things we can recognize with such as uh, beautifulness, uh, adult content, celebrity, etc. So let me give you some example. Um, so this is a uh, uh, photo generated in the Tumblr post. This is from Coca-Cola. So the algorithm said it's 90% beautiful. Second one is from an uh, underwear company. Uh, we, uh, the algorithm said 90% adult content. Um, and then saline object. So this one is from, I think, I think from some car company. Uh, the algorithm said there's one object that's important. So these numbers are all generated by the algorithm. So using all this, uh, uh, using, using this number, each blog post, uh, we, can we can make a vector, a numeric vector, and then see which vector makes more likes. That's what we do. Uh, we also did textual analysis. So these are some uh, text data from the blog post. And I mean, I'm, I'm not going to explain, uh, explain what this is, but we also did the textual analysis. Um, things that, um, since we now understand the image, we can compare the image with the text so that's what we did here. So if you look at these three examples, this is like a, uh, an image where our uh, deep learning algorithm said this is comfort, bed, window, bedroom. And indeed, the blog post said something about bed and design, bedding. So we can compare these two together. We say it's 76% similar. Uh, however, if you look at this right-hand side, the algorithm said it's gene blue, denim. But uh, the textual data was not relevant to the image. And we found that actually people like to see consistency in the blog post. So if you see consistent image and text, they like it. Otherwise, they won't like it. 
Um, so the, I mean, these are some findings we have. So people generally like the GIF animated images. They like beautiful photos, celebrities, consistent image and text. They like that. Like this. Like uh, people like it. They don't like video. For some reason. It's consuming a lot of your data data plan. Uh, maybe it's embarrassing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they don't like to have com uh, semantically complex image. They want something straightforward. They want. They don't like more sentences. So if you have a very lengthy blog post, I mean, your life is busy. <laughs> uh, they don't like to have questions. If you ask question, they won't like it. If you ask uh, to reblog, please reblog this. They won't like it. <laughs> um, some industry-specific results. So the adult content only work for a fashion industry. For the technology industry, if you have a adult content, it has negative effect. But people don't like it. So this is some of our uh, social media analytics. Okay, so third one is on business analytics. Um, this is about uh, Silicon Valley, high tech industry. There are many acquisitions in the industry. So for example, uh, Google, so Android, so Android phone, uh, the Android platform uh, is not or originated by the Google company. They acquired a company called Android. Uh, Apple Siri, you know Siri, the mm -hmm. voice recognition? They didn't make it. It was from uh, SRI International. They, it's a startup called Siri. Mm -hmm. They acquired it. So a lot of acquisition going on in the high-tech industry. Uh, for Facebook, Instagram was a different company. They bought it. WhatsApp, uh, Microsoft, they acquired Skype. So a lot of, there are many acquisitions going on. So we want to analyze, so th these are the acquisition network that we have in our data set. So we want to understand uh, what drives the acquisitions. So again, if you uh, remember the, my very first project, so there are a lot of apps, they're connected in cross promotion. We could think of each startup as a node and then we're trying to connect them together. So one side you have the big firms, the other side you have the startups. So big firms started uh, buying the startups. So this is also two-sided market. So we want to understand how the matching process is going. So again, we use some uh, textual analysis called topic modeling. So we have the textual data of the uh, Facebook, Snapchat, Koala, a lot of uh, startups. We come up with industry-wide topics and then company topics. Have you heard of TechCrunch? It's a technology uh, news channel. So they have a database called Crunchbase. So we collect the data from Crunchbase on startups, uh, about 24,000 US high tech companies. Uh, many of the companies are, one, only 1% 1 is public, meaning that 99% are private startups. Uh, we collect the headquarter location, uh, key personnel, M&A, investment, the summary. So these are uh, some companies, actually we see there are some in Dallas area, DFW area, a lot of startups. Many startups in Silicon Valley and, and here in Seattle, Boston. Companies are usually in software, web, e-commerce, app, and mobile companies. Again, so we ran the uh, text, text mining algorithm on the company description to extract what are the, um, the industry topics in the high-tech industry. So we see that there's video, music, energy, power, sports, tickets, healthcare. These are the kinds of startups in the uh, industry. Uh, so I'm, maybe I'll skip the math part. We see a lot of notations. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this one I want to uh, I want to oh. I'll give you one sentence on it. <laughs> compromise. <laughs> I need to compromise. Yeah, for the next slide. Um, in 1959, uh, there was a Hungarian mathemat mathematician called Erdős. Uh, he wanted to understand party. So if you go to party, you have a lot of uh, strangers. They get together to and mingle and talk to each other. They, he wanted to model that. And it's called random graph theory. 
So we use that theory onto the uh, our startup uh, M and A matching context. Okay, so we want to explain why these people mingle together, and that's the left hand side. Right hand side, what kind of company it is, where it is, um, are they connected socially? So if you share a lot of, uh, so say you have a co-investor, then you are connected. To compete connected. If you have uh, common board members, they are connected. So if they have, they're from, uh, they have the same, um, maybe alum in the same alumni network, UTA network, they are connected. So we consider that all the on the right hand side to, to explain the the network, the acquisition network. So we have about twenty four thousand companies, and then. We have about 400 acquisitions. We want to explain. Now, now, um, so if you have 24,000 companies, so we can think about 24,000 dots, and then if you have an acquisition, we make a link between them. Okay, so this is the network. Um, if you think about a possible number of possible graphs using 24,000 nodes, it's almost infinity. It's the same as the number of atoms in the universe. <laughs> so we have to use big data, big data platform. You cannot really understand this with one, uh, a computer, one, a single computer. So there are different definitions of big data. Uh, my definition is that if you cannot run your, your uh, model in your, in your one computer, it's not, it's, uh, if you can run it in your computer, that's it's not big data. So in this case, I have to use 100 uh, very powerful machines together to run this model. Wow. <laughs> and this is what we found. Uh, the geographical distance that didn't really matter. If they are socially connected, it, uh, if two companies are socially connected, it's very likely they will match together in the acquisition. Investor as well, and business, uh, if they have a similar business, related business, they were likely to merge together. Okay. So we again made a, a system, I mean, collecting data, analyze the big data, and then try to come up with a matching platform. So maybe I'll show you the UI. So given, so you want to, you are interested in say Foursquare, this is a startup. Uh, you can see these are the competing firms based on our model. Or uh, you are interesting in you are interested in a specific sector, say energy or security, then we will recommend these are the companies you should, you should consider. So we build a matching platform for uh, for the startup industry. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on the fourth one, uh, so on cybersecurity. So this is called what I call big data in, in action. So. An, all the three projects I've uh, worked on is more on the observational data, meaning that you don't really take any action. You passively get the data, try to understand. But in this case, we take an action um, on cybersecurity. Uh, this is what we did. Uh, so if you think about cybersecurity, uh, I mean, if your IT staff is lazy, didn't update the software, hackers can get in and do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, they can use your computer as a zombie to send spam emails. Oh, we'd be getting a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, DDoS attack. So if you measure, so what we did is we measure the spam email generated by different companies. So say UTA computers are clean, they, it, it won't generate any spam, okay? So, so say UT Dallas. Uh, oh no, <laughs> not, not, not our sister university. <laughs> Some university X, their IT staff didn't work, uh, didn't update their software, hackers get in. So that's what we did. So we measured the spam emails from 8,000 different, univer uh, not university, institution in the US. And then we ran an experiment. So this experiment, we divided, so we have 8,000 companies organizations, we divided them into three groups. So the first group, we just passively monitor the spam emails. So it's called control group. So we didn't take any action there. The second group, 
we call it private treatment. So we send a confidential email to those organizations saying, hey, you guys have this spam issue, your peers are clean, but you are bad. So we call it informational treatment. So we, give, we provide information. Third group we call public treatment. So we had our website called spamrankings.net. We made a publicity out of it. Hey, uh, actually we send them an email first and then say, hey, we have our website there. Your customer, your peer, everyone will look at your performance. Uh, if you do well, fame. If you don't do, shame. <laughs> it's fame and shame. Uh, so this is our website called cloud.spamrankings.net. Uh, so people can search for a different organization. So this, uh, UT Arlington is in there actually, in our organization. So uh, I don't know, fortunately or fortunately, unfortunately, it's in the private treatment group. So we didn't do any, did any bad. Hmm? Question? Yeah. Yeah. What if you are sending an email that there is spam going on, how will the consumer know <coughs> that your email is not a spam? Like also, oh, we're sending to the IT staff, not the general public. Um, yeah. you're, you're telling them the truth, whatever. I mean, if they're, you're only saying it to people who do have a spam problem. Correct, yeah. I mean, we didn't lie. I mean, we collected data. So this data is from third party. Uh, it's called <coughs> Spam House. Mm -hmm. It's a big spam data collection. So we collect this data every day. And then we organize which, or, which company is generating that. So we actually have the IP address. If you have the IP address, we you know where it is, and then you know uh, the organization, stuff like that. Are you curious how UTA did? Yeah, how did they do? Uh, UTA is pretty clean. Um, if you look at, so it's hard to see, but um, over 670 universities, we, we are 41. Hmm. But high is not High is the high is bad. Okay. We are 41st, uh, 41st biggest spam. Uh, but the thing is that many universities don't spam, uh, emit any spam. So in that sense, uh, we only emitted, uh, let's say, about, so this is daily. And this is number of spam emails. So at the max, we have 12 emails. So that's okay, actually, uh, considering uh, our size. Uh, hmm. Can you guess some worst spammer in the, uh, in the education space, university space? For profits, maybe? For profits, yeah, like Amazon cloud service, they generate a lot of spam. No, I mean like for profit universities like Phoenix or? Phoenix is okay, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can check. <laughs> no, let's check that. <laughs> he wasn't sure about his data there. <laughs> Phoenix. So is this accessible to everybody? Or yeah? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. You can go to cloud.spamrankings.net. Oh, it's actually, we, we don't have it. it. It's misspelled. It's P H O P H O E N I X. <coughs> Maybe it's in our control group or our private treatment. This is for public treatment. Okay. Um, UTA is not. A, maybe it's a Texas. Oh, we have rice. Let's see rice. <laughs> wow. Um, let's um, I'm gonna change it to. Oh, they only had one spam a day. Mm. Wow. It's pretty clean. So they are here, <coughs> over here. About two hundred ranked. Uh, Microsoft is quite a big spammer, actually. So, I have my So, if you look at the Microsoft, they ranked uh, number 98. This is the number of spam they emitted 3,000, 6,000. Yeah, quite a lot. I don't know if I have Amazon here. Maybe Amazon is a private treatment. Yeah, it's not here. Softly here. Yeah, they're in private treatment, maybe. So um, Amazon actually had millions of spam emails a day. Wow. So we actually had to group them together by the sector. 
So, yeah, UT, uh, UTA is actually okay. Most universities are quite clean, actually, considering how. Oh, okay, so what, this is an experiment results. We found that uh, after the experiment, the publicly treated uh, organization, they reacted. They fixed their problem, they, their STEM uh, email has been reduced significantly. So why access in the log scale? So we see an uh, exponential decrease in their STEM following. That's what we found. So fame and shame work. <laughs> uh, but uh, the information treatment didn't work. And that's what we found. So actually, we, we just got a, a grant from NSF on extension of this project. So we are working with a, some Chinese university. Uh, so this we did with the US organization. So we are replicating this experiment in China, mainly in China, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, and those uh, Chinese-speaking countries. So we will see how that works out there. Okay, so today I uh, introduced four, uh, four topics of my research. Um, so for the students, maybe if you're interested in, these are the techniques I used. Um, so first, big data, you need to have data. So how do you collect data? So you have to use API, web scraping. Uh, once you collect data, you need to manage it, store it, back up. So these are the techniques you can use. Uh, if you have a large data set, it takes a long time to process it. So uh, Hadoop, Convert, Cluster, or these say Spark, these are the technology you need to understand. So it's using multiple machines together to process it. And then you need to understand machine learning. So topic modeling, LDA, uh, clustering, deep learning. <coughs> these are the cutting edge uh, technology you need to understand. On top of it, I would recommend also taking some econ or statistics lab on econometrics, where you can understand the relationship between the variables. So these are the four tools uh, that you will want to have. Uh, if you like, I can share you the slides. So. All right, so I think we're just scratching the surface. Uh, now we will have, actually in four of my projects, and I didn't look into the video content at all. But now, it's a whole other game. Huh? Yeah, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. So now people are working on video analytics. So uh, YouTube just uh, released a few terabytes of video data to the public so that data scientists can analyze it, try to improve the algorithm. Uh, another thing is VR and AR. So now you have three-dimensional data. <laughs> well, how do you handle that? I don't have the answer now. And that's a lot of things to do. Uh, but we have toolkits, so I want to conclude my talk with uh, an example. So I did a textual analysis on the U.S. public firms. So every firm should uh, file 10K documents to SEC. So it includes a lot of textual information about the company. And then you can analyze which companies are close to each other based on text. So I look into J.P. Morgan Chase, and these are the uh, related companies but I think I'll better to do live demo. So these are the companies in our space. So I was looking at Yahoo. So Yahoo is here. So these are the similar companies to Yahoo, like Twitter, AOL. Uh, if you're interested in, in JP Morgan, Chase. So this is the whole company space. There, we have about 10,000 uh, US public firms. So each dot is a firm. So I feel mouse over. So see there's a cluster. So let's see what this cluster is. This is fundings. Yeah, these are more financial companies. So let's try to get JP Morgan. So JP Morgan is here. So these are the banks. I'm interested in say Yahoo. Yahoo is over here. So these are the IT companies over here. If I isolate them, so I can see which companies are uh, close to each other. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Any question, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, wait, 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 wait.
you, who are you gathering this information for down the line besides yourself? I mean, is, you said you had a grant, right? Uh, for the security project, it was funded by NSF. NSF. Okay, so NSF, they're wanting yeah. the data off of this for mm -hmm. what purposes, or do you know? Uh, so they, sorry, I didn't. What purpose were they? Were you gathering? What were they wanting? They looked. What were they? Oh, gathering? they wanted to see if uh, so. NSF. Uh, um, so. So, our shame and fame work, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it could be implemented as a policy. So when a, a, a company have a problem on the security, they will force them to publicize it, mm -hmm. right? Then they will work on it. So there's a feedback system. So they wanted to see if, if the U.S. government implement this policy, will that work? Mm -hmm. That was a question they wanted to answer. Okay. And we said we will uh, run this experiment. We actually found fame and shame work, but information didn't work. So I remember when you know converting from one computer to another, the the file structure for the data was was always an issue. And even now, if you download something, sometimes you go you download something and it says, all right, what what program do you want me to use to look at this thing? And then you choose some random program and it comes out to be just a bunch of mm -hmm. nonsense characters. So when you're doing your your big data stuff. I mean, you, you must be dealing with all kinds of different formats and... Oh, uh, actually, um, so many of the data set I'm getting from API, Application Programming Interface. So it's pretty standardized now in the industry. Mm -hmm. So they give you a CSV file, comma separated value, or JSON file, which is a web format where you have the structure. So it's pretty standardized these days. So, but, um, but even that, after the formatting, if you want to marry different data sets together, you need to have an identifier, right? So for example, if you have a company's data set from the SEC, they're using something called CIK as an identifier. But uh, another data set I mentioned is Crunchbase, which is, uh, which is on the uh, TechCrunch side. They have different identifier. Uh, all the, the, the common thing is only the name. But the name, you, you see, uh, sometimes people say JP Morgan, some people say JP Morgan Chase and Co. or and Company. So there are all these uh, variations. So these are some uh, practical things to marry different data sets. Do so you them. put that in by hand, or is it, or is it used? Oh, there are some algorithms that does it. Oh, by hand, no. <laughs> it's impossible. When you say machine learning, that's what you're talking about, is algorithms? Yes. Um, machine learning is a, how do I say? It's a mathematical model, but you need to tune those parameters. And how you do that, you just put all the, a bunch of uh, data set, and it will learn the parameter by itself. That's machine learning. But what is not machine learning? If you have your hand-labeled um, conditions or procedures to do something, it's not machine learning. So if you know how you classify things, and you, hand, you, you write a code that does follow that procedure, it's not machine learning. It's just an algorithm. Machine learning learns that thing by itself. Okay. Yeah. And what's important, what's not important. By looking at a huge yeah, a lot amount of data. Sets. data. Yeah, a huge amount of data. Yeah, try to recognize the common pattern. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when are the computers going to take over? <laughs> Pretty soon. <laughs> uh, I, just, I was talking to uh, about the Uber service. Uh, they started the auto, uh, auto, uh, driverless car mm -hmm. service in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So the drivers will lose their job, that's for sure. So actually, U.S. government, they, uh, last year, they made a, uh, some statement about uh, automation and how that will impact the, our U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. And they thought that maybe 30% uh, of the job will be gone, so they need to retrain the people. <laughs> that's scary, but uh, what people are, uh, people are arguing is that that happened a lot in before as well. Right. When people, when we first had the cars, car industry, the horse riding industry disappeared, mm -hmm. right? We made a transition. Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, we need, as a university, we need to uh, have a plan to retrain uh, the people. And uh, in our, in our school, this school, we have a business analytics program and information system program where we teach them this big data uh, techniques. Many of my students are full-time workers. 
they want to train, train them, retrain themselves about this technology. So, uh, but eventually the, the, the computers are learning on their own. So you don't need, you need so many people to <laughs> train in that area. Uh, and the computer trained another computer. What it learned when it. Learned. Oh, actually, the uh, the Go game example I gave you. So the uh, AlphaGo did the training by itself. Mm -hmm. AlphaGo uh, played with AlphaGo too. Mm -hmm. They just played together mm -hmm. to learn themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so the, um, if you can, if, if uh, there's such a certain thing that you can do automatically, if there's a uh, very precise procedure you follow to do something. Thing, a machine can do it better than you, right. but if you if there's something that needs your creativity, then machine is not there yet. Still, we have a room to survive. <laughs> <laughs> so creative creativity, that's the thing. I think we're all going to be doing food service, <laughs> uh, healthcare, maybe <laughs> nursing. <laughs> but the things that the machine are uh, still uh, how to say uh, these are designed by uh, smart people. Right, so uh, the thing they learn is governed by the human knowledge, still. I would say. So that's a, we need. We still need smart people. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about some of the big data techniques that you showed, <clears throat> um, like machine learning and some of the advanced clustering, uh -huh. um, has that type of analysis gotten to the point where it's predictive, or would you say that it's still pretty much descriptive? Oh, okay, so machine learning is mostly predictive analytics. Uh, and then there are uh, also people working on the, the, uh, descriptive analytics on, so try to get the causal relationship between variables. Okay. So, so they're both like, predictive analytics or descriptive analytics. Okay, so if you would, since you have a business background, I'm just kind of curious um, if you would have, say, dare I say, the old fashioned way of building a response model where you might have a logistic regression uh -huh. analysis and use that to maybe score out a set of prospective customers. Uh -huh. Each prospect gets a probability assigned. Right, 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 right. Um, is machine learning, is, is this stuff, big data analytics at that point now or is it more kind of finding the patterns and in, in some Actually, of those it does. Actually, uh, it does make decision. Um, for example, the math the first example, the, the matching between mobile apps, mm -hmm. that has to be automatic, right? So we are using machine learning to take an action. Okay. So which, which matches you, you're gonna construct. And also, uh, if you think about the advertising business, this, uh, so you have a lot of banner ads, those are placed by the algorithm. <coughs> they learn them by themselves. And then that knowledge well, will be used as a, uh, taken as an action. I so it's actually being used. Okay, interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for this question. Oh, I had a question. I'm more familiar with its use in like health. Right. I'm more familiar with the use of machine learning for public health. Okay. And what I was curious about, since you're working on four different, you've had experience on these four different projects, mm -hmm. do you find similarities between the formulas that work for the various purposes? So like in public health, there's a lot of work around using big data to determine like outbreaks or symptoms of medications that weren't found in mm -hmm. clinical trials and things like right, that. Right. Do you find a similarity as you work on those um, products? Or are they all very different? I, I see a common commonality. That's why I could work on four different <laughs> things together. Uh, actually, I did wanted to get into the health analytics uh, portion. Uh, one, one famous example is the flu prediction, right? So Google Trends data, they measure how many flu keywords they see, and they can predict that's almost <laughs> the same as the CDC report. Academics. Academics, yeah. And uh, there was one study on uh, from University of Tokyo in Japan. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not health analytics, but they have uh, a lot of earthquakes. They wanted to predict the earthquake and to have a report system to people. Um, the, the government one is was slow, so they instead came up with a social media based report system. So if people tweet a lot about earthquake keywords, they will make alarm, uh, alert to people. That was 30 minutes uh, faster than the wow. <laughs> traditional one. Mm. So uh, I, I see a lot of common common thing. Also, actually, in the healthcare system, um, 
Actually, I was talking to a local startup here in Fort Worth. Um, so um, their job was to uh, give it a symptom for, uh, so they're working on an uh, insurance company. So if a patient has a symptom, so they will recommend the best uh, doctor to, to send based on the symptom. But they not only look into the, uh, the money they need to spend, but also the after treatment, uh, if they want, they need to go follow up, check up or not. So they calculate all this uh, spending, accumulated spending, to make a recommendation which doctor to go to. Hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's coming, yeah. Of course, if the patient dies, that might be the cheapest outcome. <laughs> oh, the no deep follow up there. <laughs> uh, the deep learning uh, thing I mentioned, uh, people are using for medical images. I have a few friends in UT Southwestern. They are using deep learning on the medical images to isolate where is the disease, where is the cancer. So the thing is that the, what many things doctors do, it can be automated. So when first AI was introduced, the, the first thing they want to do is to replace doctors. <laughs> so they made something called expert system. So what is expert system? So they uh, came up with a rule uh, that doctors follow. So they interviewed all these different doctors and said, uh, what's their rule? They put them all together in a computer and they let the computer do it. And that worked well, actually. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so actually, uh, maybe you know about IBM Watson. Mm -hmm. They are now uh, part of a lot of hospitals. So when doctors are making decisions, they, they actually consult with Watson. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not really substitution, out, I say. It's a more complementarity. So they work together. <coughs> But if you think about your daily job, I mean, you're using computer, using Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint. I mean, you are use, um, using computer. You are complementing each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, I'd say uh, AI, AI, machine learning, it will be similar. Yeah, they won't click kill us. So they figure out how to generate electricity on their own. Uh, thank you so much for coming today to hear Dr. Lee speak. Uh, please feel free to join us for light refreshments and conversation about this topic or whatever is on the